Well, hey, this is John, and my research has shown me that people that respond with shock and anger to the idea that the Earth is actually flat and stationary and invoke terms like crazy and ridiculous do so because that's how they've been told to respond. You've been conditioned to respond that way, and I'll prove it in a second. If you have the courage to face the fact that you've been subjected to a lifetime of conditioning to make you believe a certain way, Ask yourself, are your thoughts really your own? Because in April 1967, the CIA wrote this dispatch, it's on the screen, which coined the term conspiracy theory. That's where it comes from. It came from the CIA. And they recommended methods for discrediting whatever they didn't like. And this was called a psych operation. It was part of their clandestine services unit. And they were attempting at the time to silence voices of that day that were questioning the JFK assassination. But as you well know, this term is used all the time for anything that officialdom doesn't like. And one of the mind control talking points that the CIA created for you was that people gravitate towards conspiracy theories because they're insecure. And these topics make them feel significant. Well, the exact wording from the document says, Critics have often been enticed by a form of intellectual pride. They light on some theory and fall in love with it, unquote. <clears throat> so if you have ever thought that or uttered that sentiment to someone, then you now have a personal example of how you have been a mind control victim. Congratulations. Undoubtedly, most cases, you probably thought the idea was your own or you know, it somehow resonated when you read it in like psychology today or whatever, but you had no idea that it was part of a premeditated military propaganda campaign by a lying government cooked up by evil sociologists in some basement office in Langley, Virginia. It was part of a complex psych warfare agenda. And see, even me explaining where the talking point comes from makes you glitch out because you've been programmed to glitch out when anyone starts calling this stuff out. But it was a lie that was planted in the data sphere that you then dutifully regurgitated over the years like a trained circus animal. I'm sorry. And there's many other similar talking points in that document that I hear people say all the time, and they have no idea that they're just like puppets on the string. Is the unlikelihood that such a deception like Flat Earth could take place represent proof that it hasn't taken place just because it's unlikely? No. The answer is no. It's not proof. Being able to see a lighthouse at night from 40 miles away is a, is a proof that the Earth isn't round. That's proof. Isn't part of the reason why you're so indignant is because you feel like you have irrefutable evidence in the form of pictures and that you don't believe that all of the space agencies and governments could possibly be lying to all of humanity. But pictures can be faked and governments can lie, can't they? And isn't it possible that your ego might not allow you to accept the idea that such a big lie might be able to take place right under your nose? It may not register at first, but deep down, when confronted with the, this idea, uh, many people conclude that they would have to be incredibly stupid for them to be able to have been deceived regarding something so huge and so fundamental. They feel that they are too smart and they just refuse to, to accept it for that reason. And this is why people decide that they don't know and they don't want to know. They don't want to face the fact that they might have been royally conned their whole life because that would be royally embarrassing. Now, I'm not calling you incredibly stupid. You are. That's what you have in internal dialogue within yourself. That's the conclusion that many people come to almost immediately when they're confronted with this idea that this could be possible. And they think to themselves, I would have to be really stupid to have fallen for that. There's no way it's true. And therefore, they throw it off immediately. 
without giving it serious consideration to avoid wounding their ego. And the second problem, however, is that the proof that you're relying on that the earth is round is fraudulent. And the first mindset that I just outlined is actually blocking you from engaging in the serious examination of that evidence. You might look at some flat earth proofs, but your arms are folded in defiance so it never penetrates your force field. So to understand what I'm talking about, this force field, imagine for a minute that some government agency contacts you and they tell you uh, that you're actually part of a secret project that was run and you were actually born in a laboratory. And they inform you that you're actually a clone and you have no soul and all the memories and experience that you have, including your encounters with God, have all been implanted thoughts. Your whole life is a fraud. You're a worthless bag of chemicals, and you were created in a test tube. Now, when they told you they had evidence that this is all true, for most people, it would be so unnerving that most people would probably say, you know what, I don't care what evidence you have. I don't know what evidence you have, and I don't want to know. Well, that's what you're like when it comes to flat earth. It's so unnerving that most people say within themselves, I don't know and I don't want to know. Search your heart. See if that's not down there as a disempowering core belief that's blocking you from critical thinking. Now, the third problem that you're up against is even if I show you the fraudulent proof and convince you beyond any reasonable doubt that it is fraudulent, you may still look the other way because the evidence is going to point you in the direction of having to retool your entire worldview. And you're certainly not willing to embrace the persecution that will surely come if you choose to be numbered among the conspiracy theory kooks of this world. Because I've found that most people are too lazy, too self-absorbed, and in love with this present world and their happy life to accept anything that requires any kind of major course corrections. They just couldn't be bothered. And so the impetus to overcome all of these obstacles is integrity. God reminds us in Psalms 51 that he desires truth in the inward parts, and the mistake that people have made in trying to convince the unconvinced is that they have resorted to providing one empirical observation after another in an attempt to convince people of their position. But it's well known that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And so if you're still listening and you'd like to actually explore the possibility that you may be under the influence of long-term programming, I would first need to help you to admit that you have been tricked before I start showing you the evidence. As Mark Twain said, it's easier to fool someone than to convince them they've been fooled. So this video is called the Flat Earth Challenge. And what I'm gonna do is thoroughly examine one observation that indicates that the earth is not round. And so the rules of this challenge are as follows. <clears throat> the goal of the challenge is not to suggest that our position is proven through this one example, but rather simply to attempt to establish mutual respect between two parties that see things differently regarding a topic that is highly polarized. The unconvinced seem to display a very irrational behavior surrounding this topic. And then they accuse truthers of being irrational. The unconvinced accuse us of not being able to have a relationship unless people believe the way we do, but they seem to be the one issuing ultimatums to either stop talking about those things or I won't have a relationship with you. They often suggest we're delusional, we're irrational or crazy because of what we believe, but we're the ones coming with rational arguments and complex videos like this one in an attempt to build bridges of understanding and we're ignored and we're brushed aside like kooks. It's a little bit like a child that throws rocks from a distance and then runs away when he's challenged. The unconvinced will regularly invoke the term conspiracy theory, which is an unchristlike attempt to shame someone into silence. It is a character assassination term 
And it is a clear violation of Jesus' warning in Matthew 5 to stop calling people raka or fool. All right, so the challenge is very simple. Either provide a rational, scientifically-based answer as to why, if the earth is round, how are we able to see the 1,450-foot-tall Willis Tower in Chicago from exactly 40 miles away, as I will show? Or, if you have no answer, you need to have enough maturity and humility to offer some sort of statement like the following. John, I don't have any explanation. Or, John, I don't believe what you believe, but I can understand why you might believe it. And you might even throw in, hey, I'm sorry for suggesting that what you believe is crazy. Would you forgive me? Throw me the bone. That's what we want. We want some respect, and we want you to acknowledge that our observation is legitimate and that you don't have an answer. Because if you tell me, I don't know, John, then you no longer have any right to call me crazy or insinuate that anything that I believe is crazy on this topic. Now, the other rule is you can't ask another question or a different question. We have to follow this question to the end where either of us has a final conclusion. Or you have to acknowledge that you don't know. That's the challenge. One question all the way to the end, and you either cry uncle or you stump me and I cry uncle. All right, so don't change the subject, don't call me names, stonewall, all those things. And uh, so, as I mentioned, very often when confronted with the idea that the earth is actually flat, uh, a lot of people respond with indignation, because primarily because they have pictures. Uh, the problem is that they've never really thought that the pictures that they are relying on could be fake. Their problem is they trust NASA. And it never dawned on them that there could be a systemic deception taking place on all of humanity. And that's exactly what's happening. So let's begin with something that you can probably agree with. And that is what I call the monkey to the man. Most people do not believe in evolution for a variety of reasons, especially if you're a Bible believer, because you'd have to reject the idea uh, that is being portrayed here because it teaches you that uh, you weren't created by God, you evolved from monkeys. So here's my first question. Do you believe that the people that continue to propagate this image on the screen into kindergarten classes all the way up to college level, uh, do you believe that they know that this isn't true? In other words, do you believe that this is a conspiracy? Or do you believe that the people that propagate this actually do believe in evolution? Okay, because the case is very strong that they do know that it's not true. We know they are, uh, they're not deceived because we have documented numerous cases where the scientific community was forced to admit their fraud, like with Piltdown Man. This is the massive scandal where it was officially admitted that scientists faked the evidence about finding the missing link when, in fact, it was a human jaw and a pig's nose. And they built an entire wax figure around it, and they paraded it through all the museums, and <clears throat> it was out for years. So if you agree that the monkey to the man is a premeditated lie, then you are admitting to the fact that you're a conspiracy theorist. So congratulations. But certainly, this is uh, not up for debate, that this was clearly a hoax perpetrated by the scientific community, premeditated. All right, now, if I ask you to ask your phone or go on your computer and ask it to show you a picture of the Milky Way galaxy, you'll get a return that looks something like this. And my question is, what are you looking at? Okay, you, NASA's going to show you this. My question is, how did they get the picture? All right, what is it? Do they have a telescope that took that picture? 
Because we're told the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across and 10,000 light years wide. So how far away would the telescope have to be to capture the entire Milky Way galaxy in the frame? Right? So if it's 100,000 light years across, it would probably have to be about that far away to be able to capture the entire Milky Way in the frame, I think you would agree. And you certainly would have trouble getting the picture you see here if you were, in fact, inside of that galaxy. So I'll ask you again, what are you looking at? How did they get the picture? Do you think we have a telescope that's 100,000 light years away? No? Well, go ahead. You can say it. It's a, it's a cartoon. <laughs> it's a cartoon. It's made up. And I know for certain that many of you right now are having to admit that this is the first time in your entire adult life that it ever dawned on you that the picture of the Milky Way galaxy that you're looking at is not a real picture. I know this is true because I have asked many people the same kind of line of questioning I just went through, and it's the same result every time. And I even did a poll on one of my live streams. There was about 100 people. So 70 out of 100, most of the demographics are folks on my channel are 30 years and above. Seven out of 10 admitted on the poll that at that moment, that was the first time they ever admitted or knew that this picture wasn't a real picture. So this sleepy, non-inquisitive state is not by accident. It's accomplished using lesser magic and deceptive wording and elaborate fake space launches to keep you accepting what is presented without questioning. Okay, so do you believe the Earth's core is molten? How do you know it's molten? Well, the answer is you don't know. You believe that because that's what you were told. You believe what you're told. And I'm, I'm, I'm not being harsh, but, you know, what I'm saying is true. Like, if you ever helped your kids with their science homework, you know, and you probably instructed them with, with a very, like, a confident, authoritative voice. Yes, Billy, the Earth's core is molten. You regurgitated the same thing that they've told you, having no clue that what you're talking about. Because the people that are telling you that are making it up. They don't know what they're talking about. If you Google the question, how do scientists know if the Earth's core is molten, they'll tell you they don't know. And then in another thousand articles, they'll tell you they do know. So they're liars. The deepest that we've ever drilled is a project in Russia called Kola Deep Borehole. Kola Deep Borehole, which went down about seven or eight miles. Okay. So anything beyond that is a guess. And I've done the research, P waves and S waves and all this stuff they tell you, complex algorithms are used to measure the distance that the waves travel. Well, the fact that they can tell you that they can analyze waves given off by earthquakes that have to travel through 3,000 miles of solid rock is total nonsense, okay? It's nonsense! They'll even try to convince you that they can tell the Earth's core is molten by studying the magnetic fields of Mars. I kid you not. I just read that the other day. So I don't believe the, that they can know that the Earth's core is molten by analyzing waves going through 3,000 miles of rock. And I don't believe they can know it because they study the magnetic field of Mars. Do you? Okay, well, that brings me to this. This cavalcade of duplicity that I've already shared with you <clears throat> is just getting started. It has brought us to this image, though, where you are now confronted with a gut punch so devastating that it's on par with finding out you are a clone. So I suggest you decide in advance to adopt the mindset of a detective, because that's the only way you're going to get through this <clears throat> and come out on the other side in the light. 
Because the detective is trained to ignore all the preconceived biases and only follow the facts, no matter where the facts lead. And that's the mindset you have to have to find your way out of this bewitchment. The fact that what I'm about to show you is so audaciously large does not in any way prove that it's not true. So you need to just calm down. You need to take a deep breath and don't take my word for it of what I'm about to show you. Once we're done, you go look it up for yourself, right? So this image is what the majority of the unconvinced are basing their indignation on when it's suggested that the Earth is flat and stationary. The picture on the left, NASA. See what I looked up? Picture of Earth from space. That's what I've been shown all my life. And so the unconvinced are convinced that photographic evidence is absolute proof. Any claim to the contrary that the Earth is flat is, fa is false. It's impossible. And the unconvinced would agree, however, that the photos can be faked, and so their problem must really lie with their trust in the organization presenting the picture. So unconvinced still has a deep-seated trust in officialdom. They haven't given themselves permission yet to completely question what is being presented, and that's where it all begins. So I'm going to help you do that. All right, remember that CIA bulletin I mentioned? And so here's the exact mind control wording that was written in 1967. It's item 4C of that document. Are you ready? It says conspiracy on the large scale often suggested would be impossible to conceal in the United States, especially since informants would expect to receive large royalties. That's probably the number one argument that people put forward of why the earth is not flat. They, they always say it. It's impossible, John, because you could never have all those people in the government keep it quiet. That is a CIA talking point from 1967. The unlikelihood that NASA and all governments are lying to all of humanity is not proof of what your eyes can plainly see and what I'm about to show you. NASA wouldn't lie does not answer the question of how I can see the Chicago skyline from the opposite shore of Lake Michigan. Okay? The proof that the Earth is flat or round must be based on observations that anyone can make, not images from the Hubble telescope. We have to take their word for that. No, we need to have answers to observable repeatable, measurable, empirical observations that follow the scientific method, which is a method of procedure that has characterized natural science since the 17th century, consisting in systematic observation, measurement, and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypothesis. Science is never turns off the, the opportunity. It's always inquisitive. So anytime you hear somebody say, oh, the earth is round, we've known it for centuries, the science is proven. Eh, that's scientism. That's not science. Scientism is a bully in a white lab coat that is propagating either premeditated lies or half-baked schemes that have no basis in reality that are put forward as proven, like the earth's core is molten. Okay, now if you click through on that picture there, you will see, there's that CIA talking point. You're gonna see if you click through to the NASA website, that initial picture, they will tell you it's an image that was created in Photoshop. It says it right there. Taking a full photograph of Earth from space takes some doing. Well, not if you have all the satellites like you say you do and you have all those space shops, ships up there like you say you do. It doesn't take anything at all. In 1962, the crew of Apollo 17 took a camera to the moon to get far enough away to bring, them, bring the full sphere into view. In 2002, NASA scientists and visualizers stitched together strips of brand new data in natural color collected over four months. They added a layer of clouds 
They added a layer of clouds using Photoshop, okay, to create this composite blue marble that became one of the most iconic images of the new century when Apple selected it as their default background. Okay, now to know this is true, by the way, the definition of an image is a representation of an external form. So a representation, which is what that is, that image of the earth is a representation of the earth. It's not a picture of the earth. It's a mock-up. It's a likeness. It's a drawing. It's an illustration. It's a sketch. It's the creation of someone's imagination. It may look like the real thing, but it's a made-up copy. That's what an image is. And they don't use that word by accident. They do that on purpose. Now, if you look at where the arrows are, <clears throat> you can clearly see that the two side-by-side -side clouds are identical. The space here and the lines, the space here and the lines, you go up to the top. This kind of looks like a United States a little bit. It's got the hole in the middle, hole in the middle. They're exactly the same. These are exactly the same over here. And these two things look like a demon face. Here's the eyes and nose, right? They're exactly the same. So you, you now know without any question that this image of the earth that you've been shown your whole life, which you thought was a picture from space, is a cartoon. Now, again, they put this very obvious clue in their sub subterfuge because if you can see this obvious fakery and still cling to your beliefs that they're legitimate, it gives the demons permission to bewitch you even more strongly. It's part of their lesser magic spell over you, like the dirt from a dead man's grave and the pinch of a bat's wing. They're going to put these clues right in front of your face. And every time you see what you're seeing here and you just keep on trucking, you go deeper into deception. Because right now you're being confronted with unequivocal ed evidence that you've been lied to. This truth has come out now, and they're trying to spin this like, oh, yeah, it's perfectly natural. We have to do it this way. But all of those explanations are irrelevant to me because it's crystal clear to everyone, and should be to you, that they put this out there as though it was a real picture all these years. They know what they were doing. They were lying through their teeth to humanity. They put some sort of sleeping spell on us so we wouldn't rise up. And you are going to have to choose right now if you're going to walk out of this into the light or not. Now, the persecution is going to be hell on earth for you, but at least you won't be deceived anymore. All right. If you keep going on this examination tour we're on, it's interesting to note there's no stars around the supposed real earth picture. The picture on the right is what you would expect it to look like, but those stars had to be added to NASA's image. The picture on the left is what NASA serves up, and there's no stars. Now, why is that? What they tell you is because the, the aperture, you know, is too slow or fast, or whatever, and, and the lights, the stars are not bright enough. You know, it's not true. You could take a picture of the stars at night with your phone and prove that that's not true. Okay, the reason there's no stars is because astronomers would easily be able to prove that the stars are not in the right place, and so their lie would be exposed. And also, some of the uh, initial astronauts from the early Apollo missions said there were no stars because they didn't get their story straight. Uh, and so they had to continue to perpetuate that lie, so they had to go with the no stars, uh, you know, look. But look at it. It looks so fake once you, like, realize, oh, my gosh, there's no stars. Even though it makes the picture suspect, they had to do it because they already said there was no stars. So do that for yourself. Go take the picture of the stars, and you'll see that they're lying. And then, of course, here's Robert Sinnon, Mr. Big Blue Marble himself, over on the left. My part was integrating the surface clouds and oceans to make to match people's expectations of how Earth looks from space. That ball became the famous famous blue marble. I don't have any expectation of how the earth looks from space, except what you show us. This is just word salad nonsense. Spinning 
spinning their little deceptions. So I'm just going by what they show us. I mean, they tell us that this is actually, you know, this is actually a picture from space our whole life, but then, I mean, uh, turns out not to be, right? Turns out they say it's 12 strips of data patched together, and then we added clouds. Well, you still might be thinking, John, this is ridiculous. The governments would not be lying to us like this. However, here is another confirmed publicized case where NASA was busted lying to humanity. Their supposed moon rock was actually petrified wood. So yes, yes, they would lie. And yes, they are lying. Just have one good despair and get it over with and then join the truth or movement. And, uh, you know, again, I believe the revelation of that moon rock is fake is done on purpose. Because even though that was proven to be fake, and people will see it like you are, people will still dig in their heels and continue to defend NASA's honor. Well, actually, they're defending their own honor. That's really what it is. Because you could see things like this. You could see things like this here. Um, and I'm just going by what they show us, okay? Because they tell us that this is the actual suit that was worn when this famous footprint on the right was made. But when you look at the boots, you can see that they're smooth and they couldn't possibly make that pattern footprint. And then people will be like, oh, yes, there's an overshoe that they wore that had the treads. You don't know that. I have watched people just jump into this gap with all kinds of things. They just make up. I'll, I'll say, well, how do you know that? And they'll be like, uh, uh, well, it's because they just made it up because they're trying to cover for NASA because they're really covering for their own ego. They're carrying the water of these liars. And so these revelations that I'm showing you should have the same kind of feeling that you'd have if, for instance, you found a home invader hiding in your closet or somewhere in your house. The natural reaction would be, you know, horror, shock, outrage. It's a showstopper, it's life-changing. It's not sloughing it off like it's no biggie. It, these can be easily explained as oversights. That's the definition of delusion, okay? Delusion is believing what's wrong and then being resistant to facts. I mean, can you not sense if this is new to you? Can you not sense within you that you might be resisting the facts that I'm putting in front of you? Those facts are defined as things that are obvious and these things that I'm showing you are obvious. Therefore, they're factual. And you have an integrity issue if you're able to just sweep these empirical observations under the rug of your happy life and just keep on rocking. Now, if you can see this and not be forced to admit that there's fakery going on, then it may be too late for you. You may be so given over to this deception that you're unreachable and just incapable of being honest. Lacking humility that you've been fooled your whole life, you'd rather hold on to a lie. You'd rather lie to yourself and your family than admit you've been tricked. And this is really wicked. It's a shameful, wicked type of behavior that the majority of the population of the world is engaged in and people need to repent. They need to stop loving lies and loving this world. Okay, because as you can see, the artifact around the Earth, as you can see, when you put this image that we were given by NASA into Photoshop and change the contrast, you'll see this perfect artifact appear. And uh, photography experts have stated over and over, the only explanation for this is that it was cut and pasted into this picture to, you know, as a fake. So isn't it ironic that the unconvinced accuse us of being tricked by Photoshop tricks, and it's actually the unconvinced that are tricked by Photoshop tricks. <laughs> okay, now this one is a couple of the astronauts, and you can see very clearly the guy on the right with the red shirt 
you can see where they've edited out the wires, but they didn't edit out the pointed part of the shirt where the wires are connecting. It's very obvious that he's hanging by wires. And there are other ones where you can actually see the wires. So they use a variety of different special effects to convince you they're in a zero G gravity in this space station when they're actually in some studio like in Cape Carnival somewhere. <clears throat> and they use a customized jet that makes nose dives and it gives them about a full minute of real weightlessness. And so they switch back and forth between the wires and all the, you know, special effects and then the weightlessness to trick you. So in order to know for sure that this is true, what I'm saying, you can do this yourself. Okay. And I captured my, Google inquire queries to show you. So my first question is, how high up is the International Space Station? Okay. And what the uh, data sphere tells me is they're 250, let's just call it 250 miles above the Earth's surface. Okay. So my next question is, well, what are the layers of the atmosphere? So but 400, they'd be right in the middle of the thermosphere because the thermosphere is about 100 to 800 uh, kilometers. Sorry, it's 254 miles is 400 kilometers, okay? So 400 kilometers puts you right in the middle of the thermosphere, okay? So my next question is, what is the International Space Station made of? Well, it's made of titanium, Kevlar, steel, and aluminum. And actually, if you look at it closely, it's mostly aluminum. Lightweight aluminum rather than steel comprises most of the outer shell of the modules. Okay? It's not, it's not like super aluminum, like from Krypton or something. It's aluminum. Okay, so my next question is, what is the temperature in the thermosphere? Well, what NASA will tell you is that it reaches up to 450, sorry, 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It's at least it's over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, as high as 4,500. Well, then I asked, what is the melting point of aluminum? And the answer is 1,221 degrees. Well, that presents a problem, and I don't think you need a PhD to figure out what the problem is. If the melting point is 1,200, same with, uh, they say it's made a lot of Kevlar. Kevlar will melt at 930 degrees. So both around the same, way, way below, you know, their melting point is, is good. They're going to melt. Okay. So I said, all right, my next question, why doesn't the ISS melt in the thermosphere? And the answer is, while the temperature of the thermosphere can reach almost 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, there are not enough gas molecules to transfer the heat to materials. Now, this is scientism. This is nonsense that you choose to believe right at this moment. Because here's my response. If there isn't enough, quote, gas molecules to transfer the heat to the materials, then how do I feel the heat of the sun? How do I get a suntan? Didn't it have to transfer through the same space that it travels through before hitting the IS, ISS? No, I'll tell you where there are plenty of molecules to absorb the heat. They're in the supposed ISS. So even if what they're saying is true, it wouldn't be true as soon as that radiation started to hit the molecules in this space station and it would melt. So if this story was real, that thing would melt like little Sally's ice cream scoop that fell on the hot summer sidewalk. I'm sorry. So I could keep doing this for the next two hours. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to stop here with the mind control demonstration and just ask you, what is it going to take to get people to snap out of the trance that they're in and to humble yourself and be willing to admit that you've been duped and show you how easy it is for them to fake all this stuff? This is a blue screen or a green screen, same thing, that's used all the time in Hollywood to create movie magic, right? Special effects that make you believe the actors are on, on the prairie or in a battle or on a plane, or in this case, standing in front of a saloon. So the guy you see on the left, 
has some real props near his foot, and then there's a barrel behind him, and then he's just standing in front of the screen with a grid, and all they have to do is push the button, and suddenly he's in the Old West standing in front of a saloon. And you can't really tell the difference a lot of times. Right? So you've got the uh, movie with Sandra Bullock. And if you look at this movie's budget, it's called Gravity. Uh, you'll see it's about a $100 million budget. And the effects are they're indistinguishable from what you see when you watch any of NASA's performances. So if you're watching the movie Gravity, you know in the back of your mind that it's just a movie. But frequently you'll engage in what's called suspension of disbelief. This is the mental process where you sort of give yourself over to the story. We all do it. And we become intellectually and emotionally invested in the characters and what they're going through. And the experience becomes a very powerful pseudo reality where you can experience a full range of emotions as though the event is actually taking place. So you get lost in the story. And this is the same thing that's going on when you're watching NASA astronauts do their thing. And my goal is to reverse suspension of disbelief. I want you to start to watch it with a questioning eye, like the Bereans in the Bible. <clears throat> Cassandra Bullock's movie had a $100 million budget. And guess what NASA's budget is? $52 million a day. They get billions a year to make cartoons and fake uh, moon landings and fake rocket launches and fake, fake, fake. It's all part of Operation Paperclip. They brought all the Nazi scientists over here. Werner von Braun headed it up. He was a Nazi scientist. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the world is a, a sci-fi horror movie and it's a nightmare, but you know what? It beats being deceived and being led around by the nose. Okay, because here are the lying sacks of Freemason excrement, supposedly training to walk in space, but all they're really doing is training to film a face, fake spacewalk in the same pool you're looking at right now. Then they'll use special effects and make it look real. These people want you dead, okay? This is not a game. It's coming down to the wire, and you need to snap out of it because this pool – has a life-size mock-up of the International Space Station that they're able to go in and out of in their fake spacesuits, and they can climb all over it and pretend that they're doing repairs. It looks like they're in space when they you know, have the grids behind where they are, the blue screens, right? They can pretend that they're doing spacewalks and looking down at the ball Earth. All of it is designed to get you to deny the existence of God. Because the people that are creating this fakery are Luciferian, Freemason, psychopath mobsters. The only thing between you and the revelation that that's true is your pride. Now this piece of work, it's no accident that George Bush Sr. is in this particular picture. This real-life Skeksis, child-eating Lucy is the kingpin of the Bush crime family. And these Luciferian overlords love to mark their territory like a dog. And so they allowed this image of this mob boss to be released while he's in front of a screen showing you that the astronaut is in front of one of these blue screens. If you've ever watched any of the mobster movies, the mobsters will always say things like, hey, oh, if you're dumb enough to be a victim, then you deserve to have me rob you, right? The mobsters believe might makes right. And if you're dumb enough to be shown all the things that I'm showing you and still clap your hands for NASA like a train seal, then you truly deserve God's door prize of strong delusion, which is laid out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for all those who do not love the truth. And truth is truth. I know it's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I'm here to tell you that truth is truth. And if you can look at all the stuff that I've shown you, what I'm about to show you, and still cling to your belief system about NASA and the governments, whew, you're in trouble. 
They're showing you on purpose because they know that you're so brainwashed, even when they show you what they're doing, that you won't stop believing the whole thing is real. And that will just solidify you. You have to break out of the trance, please. I'm begging you, okay? Here he is in the pool, okay? Remember that little limerick? Went like this. <clears throat> Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. Here is the minister climbing the stairs, and here is the minister saying his prayers. Remember that? Well, I've got another limerick. Okay, you ready? Here is a liar dressed in a suit. I know he's a liar because there's no print on his boot. Here is a picture at NASA's home base. He's supposedly training to go into space, but he's in no danger and can avoid any wrecks because he'll go to space using special effects. Okay, here he is in the pool. Here he is in space. Here he is in the pool. Here he is in outer space. In the pool, in the space. He's really not in outer space right there. He's actually in a pool. And you say, well, why can't you see the water? Is there any indication that they're actually underwater and they're supposedly doing these spacewalks? Well, buckle your seatbelts because this is not a Saturday Night Live skit that I'm showing you. This is on Fox News where astronauts get snorkels for emergency spacewalks. New snorkels made of water vent tubes and restraint valves. If water enters the helmet, astronaut lean down for air. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's real. Look, at here is, here is one of NASA's own, Allison Bollinger. This is a Freemason high priestess at the Johnson Space Center. She's probably a guy that has been modified to look like a woman, or she's a simulant. Or, you know, if she is human, she's a blood-drinking pedophile sex priestess that hates humanity. She plans to merge with machines because that's what her demigod that she worships told her. But her covenants force her to get you to die willingly through deception, which I'm plainly showing you, but it doesn't matter because somehow most people watch this will be able to somehow throw off this and just keep singing the same song. You out to be a fool by talking seriously, okay? You can go look this up and watch them talk seriously about how astronauts need to have snorkels in space, knowing that you'll believe her, that this is not completely impossible and completely cray-cray stuff that's made up. And it's like, if you don't stop resisting what's right in front of you, then you really deserve everything that's coming to you from these psychos. Are, are there any other, because the snorkels and the new observant padding made to prevent what happened in July when an Italian astronaut nearly drowned as his helmet filled with water. It actually happened twice on their NASA feet, okay? While they're supposedly in space, their helmet fills with water. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, there's bubbles. The reason that we know they really aren't in space is because the official NASA feeds show us bubbles all the time. And if you say that you can't believe everything you see on the internet, I'm going to climb through this computer screen and bop you on the side of the head. Okay, I had a VHS when I was young in my car. No, a track tape. Remember those things? And it wouldn't work. I have to bang it. So maybe that's the answer. Why don't you try that yourself? See the bubbles? Okay, here, look, look at this. This is the space station, and all that stuff is bubbles because they're underwater. And then, of course, you know, it's just that easy to take somebody in this studio and put them in space. But this is Stanley Kubrick in the middle with all the leaders of NASA in the mid-'60s. Of course, Stanley Kubrick made the 2001 Space Odyssey movie, which was awesome. So he had a lot of space movie experience, so they reached out to him. And there's actually a video where he, Stanley Kubrick admits that he faked the moon landing. 
if it's actually him. And then, of course, he put a bunch of clues in his one flew over the cuckoo nest. So there are whistleblowers, if you're listening. All right, now I haven't gotten to my proof yet, but I'm done with presenting to you evidences of mind control that will stop you from receiving what I'm now going to show you. Okay, so give yourself permission to question officialdom because what you believe is what's on the left. You're, you're the girl saying, I can see the city, even though it's behind the curve. And the truth is like, uh, you're crazy. We can't see around corners. All right. So if you were to ask, do you think it's crazy to suggest you can see around corners? What would you say? I think you'd have to say yes. I think it's crazy. All right. But then you have the people on the left, on the sorry, on the right. And then, you know, I'm saying I'm able to see Chicago because the earth is flat. And then what is the person telling me? They're telling me I'm crazy. So my question is, is it crazy to suggest that I can see all the way from 40 miles away, even though it should be completely obscured by curvature because it's not curved? Doesn't that sound like it's not crazy? Or yes, I agree. It's not crazy. So. The challenge that I've shared already is either provide a rational, scientifically based answer as to why, if the Earth is round, you're still able to see approximately 75% of the Willis Tower in Chicago from 40 miles away, or have enough maturity and humility to offer those statements. I don't have an explanation. Don't ask another question. Okay, now here's all the arguments. I'm going to help you. All the arguments against this flat earth conclusion in my specific uh, example here. The first argument is, well, you haven't considered the height of the observer above sea level and any other elevations, which I have. You haven't considered the height above sea level of the object, which I have. You haven't considered the difference in eye level between the object and the observer, which I have height of the object, 1,445 feet, the exact distance from the object when the observation is made. We actually have that using GPS equipment in the, uh, the source video that we're going to use. And then, of course, you have to eliminate the possibility of any atmospheric distortions, which we absolutely do with this video. Then the only other arguments the, that I've heard is your math is incorrect, which I'll address or the building that you're showing is not actually the Willis Tower, which I will address. And finally, a fallback argument. Well, John, I don't really have an answer, but it's just flat there, but the world is still round. No, it's not round. It, you can do this everywhere. The only reason I'm using this particular location is because it's so highly documented. And lastly, you're lying and your evidence is Photoshop. And if that's your only argument, then I would suggest you would have to provide proof that I'm lying or proof that it's Photoshop because anybody's going to be able to repeat what I've done. Okay. And so <clears throat> if the earth is round, why am I able to see the Willis Tower? Okay. Now, Rob Skiba is an award winning documentary filmmaker. He's actually passed away. Uh, he's a researcher and the author of several Amazon best-selling books and has a long-standing ministry. And one of the things that he researched quite a bit was Flat Earth. So he finally got fed up with the argument that the reason you can see the city from 40 miles away is because of atmospheric lensing or atmospheric looming or it's a superior mirage. And what he did to dispel that was he rented a boat and he filmed from the opposite shore of Lake Michigan all the way across, and the entire time you could see the city. All of recorded history shows us and tells us that mirages or atmospheric things that were illusions would disappear as you get in closer to them, and that never happened. So if you tell me it's atmosphere, I'm going to say, no, it's not, because we proved it with this video, and you'd have to unprove that. Uh, empirical observation. 
So that's the name of the video. There's the link. It's called Rob Skiba Proves the Chicago Skyline. As seen from the other side is not a mirage. And I'm actually going to show you a couple of uh, clips from it real quick. So my video is based on his video. So let me do that. Okay, I'm going to pull up a couple of videos. The first one is him explaining why he made the video. Here we go. So with that in mind, let me just say that this video and the purpose really of, of the trip, the one goal I had was to prove that what people are seeing from the other side of Lake Michigan is not a mirage, that they are actually seeing the city. That was my goal going there. I believe we achieved that goal. And so that is the primary focus of this video. Okay. This uh, also gives you a sense of, of them leaving from the opposite shore and stating that they could see the city from 42 miles away. Here we go. You can see Chicago, we're about 42 miles away. I can see it. The problem is trying to get the, the camera's having trouble focusing on it because it's moving up and down and it's so zoomed in. But I can totally see it. But it's just not fast. We have one that today come on over here. 200 cop. That's so. There's a city right there. Yeah, you're gonna. But you're gonna have to. You know, it's zoom all the way in first, and then try to count. You can run cop or what? She'll definitely catch fish. That's amazing. 40 miles away. Okay. There you go. You can see the city building right there at 42 miles and one last quick one you'll see it a lot better than that in a second here okay this is the distance to the sears uh, tower i found it that it was actually 46 statute miles from the little alcove there in the marina to the sears tower or willis tower as it's now called right to here directly to the tower See, that was exactly 46 miles right to the tower from uh, where we were. Okay, so one more video where it shows how they know exactly how far away they are from this Willis Tower at any given time. How far out are we now? Okay, so the GPS equipment had the Willis Tower tagged. So as they're coming across, they know exactly how far away the boat is from the object that we're observing. Okay. So let me go back to uh, my PowerPoint. So the first argument is going to be that the reason you can see the city is because of atmospheric lensing, looming, or a superior mirage. And this idea is really nonsensical because even the math indicates that lensing and looming is like a very small refraction. It's not going to go around corners. And so, you know, this, this appeal to authority type uh, response where – you know, the math is so complicated, you could never know for sure if this whole image of the city could go around corners. Reminds me of what Nikola Tesla pointed out, that today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. You can't see around corners because of uh, air moisture particles in the air. Maybe a one or two percent, five percent refraction, but it's not going to go over a thousand feet of curvature and zoom around the curve and come to your eyes on the other side of the hill. No, no, <laughs> it's not happening. It's not what thousands of years of history tells us, and it's not scientific either. And so 
the video though is natural science. It's uh, making obs observations and then forming a hypothesis. The hypothesis is if you get in a boat and you can see the city from 40 miles away and then 30 miles away, 20 miles away, 10 miles away, all the way across, that proves that it wasn't an atmospheric illusion. So it's not a superior mirage, it's not lensing, and it's not looming. And the captain even says in the video that he could see the skyline almost every day because those atmospheric uh, mirages are very rare. They require very specific atmospheric conditions that are not present most of the time. And the, and the captain says, oh, yeah, we always see the city from over here. Okay? So it's not a mirage. All right, so this is the tower that we're going to look at. It's 1,451 feet. It's at 233 South Wacker Drive. There it is on the left. Okay, so here's all the buildings, the skyline, and we're looking at the Willis Tower. Okay, now there it is from eight miles away. Okay, that's the same building right there is right there. Okay, so you got this building here, then the Willis Tower. Okay, that's that building there and the Willis Tower. Okay. So I want to make certain you understand that that is the Willis Tower. It's not this one over here or whatever. Okay, now, this is the Willis Tower at 31 miles away. Same building there, building. And then 38 miles. That one's a little hard to see, but you could still make it out. And then here it is at 40 miles. This is the one that we're going to work with. And you can see there's the building next to it and the Willis Tower, 40 miles away. Now, this is exactly correct because this number is, is derived from the GPS on the boat tagged to that building. So when this picture was taken, they were 40 miles away. And that's important for our calculation. <clears throat> and here is the um, what we're seeing. And here is the... What do you call it? The skyline. Okay, this is what it's going to look like when we are at 40 miles away zoomed in. It's going to look a little cloudy, but you can very clearly see the top part of it and then the most majority of it down to here. And as you'll see here in a moment, this is the building again to scale. Okay, it's 1,450 feet up to the top. So from here to here is 1,450 feet. So then what I did is I shrunk it down. So I'll, I'll show you here. But here's the math. It's actually the Willis Tower. It used to be the Sears Tower. Okay, this building sits on the ground at 593 feet above sea level. The observer, which is Lake Michigan, is at 579 feet above sea level. And then you have a guy standing on a boat. That's about four feet above the water and then he's six feet so another 10 feet so the difference here between the the observed and the ob observer is only about four feet okay then we have the distance from the sears tower is 40 miles these data points are the key to why this is an accurate uh observation because i have these numbers now you can argue that the map is uh invalid somehow you'd have to convince me of that uh, but absent that, I do have the exact heights and the eye level differentiation and all that. The building is 1,451 feet tall. So there's 940 feet of curvature at 40 miles because it's two inches per mile squared, according to all four Earth curvature calculators on the Internet one of which is MIT, PhDs, the other two or three are the same. They're all created by PhD math gurus. So if you're going to claim that the math is incorrect, you're going to have to convince me that all four of those long-standing Earth curvature calculators are wrong and you're right. You'd have to prove that to me. You can't just say it. You have to prove it because I don't believe you. I believe that the four math guys on the online are right. Right, And so at 40 miles, they are telling us, as I'll show you, that there should be 940 feet of curvature between me and that building. 
So that means you should only be able to see 510 feet of the building at 40 miles away. But it's clear that you can see most of the building. Okay, here it is. Here is the building to scale. So they're both at the same size now. So you'll see 940 feet is this yellow line. From here to here is 940 feet. That's all you should see is what's above the yellow line. If the earth is round, all you should see is what is above the yellow line. However, as you can plainly see, you can see all of this. So what you're looking at is absolute proof that at least Lake Michigan is flat. Unless you can come up with some explanation as to why I'm not considering something, I'm not factoring something in, there should be 940 feet of curvature, which means none of this should be visible. Okay, here it is. How high above sea level is Lake Michigan? 579 feet. Here is the marina where they left from. Okay, I looked at the elevation for the marina, which was 624 feet, which tells me when I looked up the sea level of the lake itself, 579, that sounds about right. So I, I agree with this number. This is uh, a good number. And then here is the height above sea level of the building, okay? 593 feet above sea level. That's from the USGS. Okay, so we have our uh, we have our numbers. Okay, so the Willis Tower is at 593 feet above sea level. Lake Michigan is 579. That's a 14 foot difference. Then you have a man standing in a boat. That's 10 foot. So that, that makes this number higher. So now you only have a four foot difference. We put that number in here and we put the number 40 here for 40 miles, four feet of eyesight level difference, and you get an obscured object of 940 feet of curvature. All four of the online curvature calculators pretty much agree. They come up with the pretty much the same number. Okay, here's an example of them. This one was based on 54 miles, but you can see 1536, 1536, 1536, 17, 14. So first argument is your math is wrong. Okay, this is somebody trying to debunk the math. Well, you might start by checking your math. You're calculating the drop as eight inches per mile squared, which is wrong. It's wrong for a lot of reasons, but the biggest is that 59 miles is measured along the curved surface of the earth, not along a straight base of Pythagorean triangle set on a plane. Okay, well, Eric DeBay is quoting William Carpenter in his book talking about plane sailing. And he says, ship captains in navigating great distances at sea never need to factor the supposed curvature of the earth into their calculations. Both plane sailing and great circle sailing, the most popular navigation methods, use plane not spherical trigonometry, making all mathematical calculations on the assumption that the Earth is perfectly flat. If the Earth were in fact a sphere, such an errant assumption would lead to constantly glaring inaccuracies. Plane sailing was, has worked perfectly fine in both theory and practice for thousands of years. And plane trigonometry has time and again proven more accurate than spherical trigonometry in determining distances across oceans. It is so commonly used at sea, navigation in theory and practice states that in practice, scarcely any other rules are used but those derived from plane sailing. The great and serious objection to plane sailing is that longitude cannot be found by it accurately, although in practice, it is more frequently found by it than any other method. So both latitude and longitude are found most often and most accurately by assuming Earth to be flat, more accurately, even assuming the Earth be spherical. Okay, so we've we've dispelled atmosphere. We've addressed the fact that the math is incorrect, which I disagree because all four calculators agree and plain sailing is how to do it. And then this objection regarding the eyesight level, this person actually agrees with us. 
He says, if your eye is six feet above the water, then you can see an object at 2,000 feet above sea level of the lake. If you're standing 20 feet above the level, you can see an object 1,800 feet. So <clears throat> we've addressed the issue of the eye level very closely right here. Okay, when we did all this math right here. The eye level difference is four feet. So it's not that. It's not our math. It's not atmosphere. So what's left? We know that the distance when the picture was taken is actually absolutely correct because the GPS was mapped to that building. So when they took the picture, they knew exactly how far it was. So the last argument would be, well, I don't really have an answer, but it's certainly, so if it's flat there, it doesn't mean the earth is flat. The earth is still round. There's just flat places on it. Well, that's a, that's a statement. It doesn't have any basis in reality, though. Everywhere you go, it's flat. Lighthouses would never work on any, any place because mariners will tell you, you can see a lighthouse on a clear night from 30 to 40 miles away. And the tallest lighthouses are 400 feet tall. So, no, it's not just flat there. It's flat everywhere. Uh, the Jeddah Lighthouse holds the Guinness Book of World Records for being the tallest lighthouse. It's 435 feet. Okay, so, you know, at 40 miles, you have uh, 935 feet of curvature. So no lighthouses would work unless you were really close, which is not what people tell you. And you have this with microwave direct line of sight um, technology. Those wouldn't work on a round earth. Uh, a rail gun would not work on a round earth because they're known to, to go almost 100 miles, I saw, in a straight line. But even 30 miles wouldn't work in a straight line. So it isn't flat just there. It's flat everywhere. Okay, let me go all the way back to all of the arguments to make sure we've addressed them. We, we address the height of the observer and the height of the object, the difference in eye level, okay, the height of the object and the observer, the exact distance. We eliminated atmospheric distortions. We address the math. We address the fact that it is the Willis Tower. And that's it. I, I don't know of any other arguments that you could put forward to, to, to refute this, but I will see. I'll post this and gladly respond. My email is pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. So if you'd like to comment on this, um, I would be glad to hear you and respond to those. Uh, Earth is not literally flat, of course, but if large bodies of water are parallel to the same datum line over thousands of miles, it's not a globe. It's a level plane, right? They're all, this is a datum line. And then, you know, everywhere that that um, we have non-NASA balloons going up, uh, you can see that the Earth is flat. But this is what I'm going to end with. This is very compelling because what you see at the top is science. That's what we observe. The, the beakers on the left show that the water finds its level. And then if you have beakers on a round object pointing out at an angle, the water is going to act the way it is shown there at the top right. It's going to be level to the ground. But what we're asked to believe is what's shown on the bottom, that as you go around this globe, the water is going to be tilting on an angle like that. And you're told that it's that way because the earth is so big, but it's not a magic ball. It's just a ball and it's not a ball, okay? It's not a ball, it's flat. That's why the water is not acting like that because it doesn't act like that. And so I invite you to do your own research, uh, consider contacting me with questions about this observation only, please the observation of the, the Willis Tower 
Chicago skyline from 40 miles away. If you try to debunk it, I will be glad to respond and we'll have a back and forth. And hopefully if you find, end up not having an answer, that you will uh, be glad to post that in the comments below that you don't have an answer. And John, I don't think you're crazy. That will be a gift. All right. Thanks for listening. Hope you have a great day. Look forward to hearing from you.